Hello, everyone from California. I'm Philip Yun, CEO of World Affairs. Uh, wherever you happen to be, I hope you and your loved ones are all safe and staying healthy in this time of sheltering in, which for us here in the Bay Area is still ongoing, um, and we are not sure when exactly that uh, is all going to be lifted. Um, let me thank all of our World Affairs members, um, our friends, and our partner for this program, the Pacific Council on International Policy, for being with us. Um, if you want to learn more about World Affairs programming, or if you like what you hear today, and I hope you will, I hope you can support us at worldaffairs.org. That's one word. So I'd like to welcome you all to our dial-in Zoom event. Um, and it's with two of my favorite people, Dr. William J. Perry, former Secretary of Defense, and Tom Kalina, the Policy Director at Plowshares Fund. Briefly, you know his biography, we've given it to you, but let me just say a few things. Uh, Dr. William Perry was the 19th Secretary of Defense under uh, President Clinton, um, and he's received numerous awards and honors, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, on a personal note, I've known Bill as my boss, uh, my mentor, my colleague, and my friend. And for me, um, you know, he's long been my model for public service. Uh, Bill Perry is what I call a shining example of the many things we can do in our lifetime to make a meaningful difference in the world. Uh, Tom Kalina is currently the policy director at Plowshares Fund. He has 30 years of nuclear security experience. He's, highly, he's a highly respected expert within the Washington policy community and is stated in the book, which I'll show in a second, a rabble rousing policy wonk. <laughs> I worked closely with Tom for many years when I was at Plowshares Fund and I can also say this a true conviction, you will not find a person more dedicated to making the world a safer place from the risk of nuclear weapons. So, as you know, um, they have published a brand new book, and here it is. Um, it's called The Button, uh, The New Nuclear Arms Race and Presidential Power from Truman to Trump. And it just came out this month. And um, we're gonna be using this, the story, uh, which this book is a story about how two different people, Bill Perry and Tom Kalina, from very different backgrounds and perspective came together with a common message and to write this book. Um, and it serves as the perfect backdrop for us to discuss the real risks of nuclear weapons today. So we're gonna do something a little bit new in this notion of um, doing things sort of remotely. We have, uh, instead of seeing us the whole time in, in, in these squares or however you've got it presented, uh, we're going to have a 15-minute slide presentation by Tom and Bill. We're then going to move to the Q&A session where I will start um, asking questions, but all of you can ask questions by tapping on the Q&A mode and sending them to me, and I will do my best to integrate them into the conversation as we, as we go forward. So please feel free to give me questions as they come up. I think the slide, pre uh, uh, the slide presentation will spur a lot of questions on your part. So that's a great way to start it off. So with that, let's go to, let me welcome um, Bill Perry and Tom Kalina. Thank you for joining us. Uh, well, Philip, uh, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I just want to thank you um, for all the time uh, you put in at Plowshares Fund, where you were before this. I had the pleasure of working with you for five years. Uh, at Plowshares, and uh, we greatly miss you there, and it's great to see you here. So uh, thank you so much for, for having us. Uh, I'm gonna run a slideshow, so yeah. I'm gonna share that. So if the, if the technology gods are smiling, uh, this will all work, so bear with me for just a second. Perfect. Is, is that working? Yeah. Okay. Like on my end, yes. All right, so hopefully you can all see uh, a picture of our, our beautiful new book. Um, and in addition to the honor I had working with Philip uh, when he was at Plowshares, I've now had the additional honor of uh, co-authoring a book with, with Bill Perry, which was truly was an honor. Um, this book, as Philip said, comes out this month. And we plan that uh, for three reasons. Uh, one, as many of you know, uh, next month, July 16th, is the 75th anniversary of the first nuclear test, the Trinity test. Um, and then the next month, August, marks the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
And of course, this November, we will choose our next president. Um, so a lot of, uh, of big events coming up. And these events create what we see as a historic opportunity to debate the future of US nuclear policy. Um, we've lived with these bombs now for 75 years. And so the question is, what should the next president do to reduce the risks of nuclear war? Now, try, ah, good, next slide. Um, first, let me put the book in context, if I could, for the current moment. Uh, as we all know, we're in a national crisis with at least three dimensions, uh, public health, the economy, and racial injustice. And to top it all off, we have a leadership vacuum. Um, and to truly move beyond this crisis, the status quo and U.S. policy must change. Uh, as the coronavirus has shown us, U.S. defense policy has been focused on the wrong threats. And we're spending way too much on outdated Cold War scenarios like great power military conflict with Russia and China, and not enough on the true existential threats that we face today, uh, pandemics, climate change, and nuclear war. And of course, uh, the raging unemployment and the systemic racial inequalities that are now all too obvious uh, show that we've been investing too much in traditional defense and not enough in building a strong economy and a just society. Um, so despite spending $700 billion a year and more on defense, uh, many Americans simply do not feel safe and secure. Um, as Martin Luther King Jr. warned in 1967, quote, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Uh, and I think he was right. So getting back to the issue at hand, um, nuclear weapons in particular have no role to play in addressing the most serious threats we face. Uh, in fact, they can make those threats even worse. So let's get into the book and let's unpack that um, a bit. Um, we like to start with this photo because it tends to focus the mind. Uh, here is President Trump, of course, with uh, the infamous football, it's the briefcase being carried by the military aide right behind him. That briefcase contains everything the president needs to start nuclear war. Uh, this is literally how close we are to nuclear war every day, every minute, uh, right now. President Trump can order attack on his own authority. No second opinions from Congress or the Secretary of Defense uh, are required. Now, we don't mean to single out President Trump here. Um, you know, some might say that his impulsiveness and disregard for expert opinion highlight these concerns, but all presidents make mistakes. Um, all are too human. And in our opinion, uh, no single human should control the future of humanity. And that's the situation we're in right now. Yet we, the American people, choose to do this. We choose to give presidents this, this absolute power. Uh, why? This is one of the central questions that we explore in the book. Why do we choose to live so close to the brink of disaster? Uh, and what we assert in the book is, is it's because US policy is simply focused on the wrong threat. Um, so in the book, we make this central argument uh, that US policy is focused on the wrong threat of a surprise attack from Russia. Uh, we find that such an attack is highly unlikely for the simple reason uh, that it would mean utter destruction for both sides. Um, and yet US policy has been based on this threat for decades. And the big problem here is that this mistake in threat assessment undermines US security by driving policies that increase the risk of blundering into nuclear war by mistake. Uh, US policies increase the risk of starting nuclear war in response to a false alarm, one of the greatest dangers in the world, and which we think is unnecessary uh, for deterrence. So we conclude that we must move away from quick launch policies and instead give the president more decision time by limiting nuclear use to second strike deterrence only missions. Um, so Bill, let's bring you into the conversation here. Um, you of course had a front row seat to the arms race and you met with many Soviet and Russian officials uh, during your days in and out of office. Um, some might challenge our key assertion 
that a bolt from the blue from Russia is not a realistic threat. Uh, and what would you say to that? Uh, it is not. During the time I was Secretary of Defense, I met with all of the senior leaders in the Russian government. I met, and then the 20 years or so after that, I continued on so-called track two, unofficial dialogue with hundreds of Russians. The one thing I can say with great confidence, the Russians are not stupid and they're not suicidal. So we have been focused, as you have said, Tom, on the wrong threat. The threat is not that we'll be subjected to a surprise attack. The threat is that we will blunder into a nuclear war. Thank you, uh, Bill. And, and, and where we go next in the book is to discuss how this perceived threat of a bolt from blue attack uh, drives military requirements uh, that we must be ready to launch nuclear weapons at all times within minutes. Um, and that in turn drives uh, three dangerous policies. Uh, first, that the president has, as we've discussed, sole authority to launch nuclear weapons within minutes with no second opinions or oversight. Uh, second, that the president can order a first strike, uh, first strike, and is not limited to retaliation, as, as many uh, Americans think is the case. Um, and third, that the president can launch uh, hundreds of land-based ballistic missiles, uh, ICBMs, on warning of attack without waiting for proof of attack. Um, and Bill, in the book, we go in quite detail uh, as to why these are dangerous. Please give us your sense of why these policies are so dangerous. They're dangerous because they make us so susceptible to starting a nuclear war through a false alarm. And in case you think that's a theoretical concern, I will tell you we have had six false alarms that I know about. One of them is particularly meaningful to me since it occurred to me when I was the Under Secretary of Defense at three o'clock one morning, I was awoken by a phone call from the General of the North American Air Defense Command telling me that his computers were showing 200. ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. On the way. He quickly modified by saying, but he had concluded his computers were in error, that he was getting a false alarm. He was calling me to see if I could help him figure out what had happened, what had gone wrong with his computers. On this particular false alarm, it was a result of the computer chip very simple, cheap computer chip, a technical error. But we've also had false alarms from human error. So we can have either a technical error or a human error causing a false alarm. We've had six of them and we may have more. That is why this is so dangerous. Thank you, Bill. Um, let's, uh, let's dig into that a little deeper on this question of sole authority. Uh, in 1963, in fact, uh, this week in 1963, President Kennedy gave a famous speech where he warned that we could stumble into nuclear war due to, quote, accident, miscalculation, or madness. Uh, Bill, give us your sense, please, on how this might happen. Well, first of all, the president can get bad information. And then the classic example of that, which happened to President Kennedy, was he was getting bad information on Cuba when he had to make a decision. His Joint Chiefs of Staff were unanimously recommending to him a, a military invasion of Cuba. He was holding off on that, but they were pressing very hard. Had he accepted that, he would have, he would have done so without the knowledge that besides the medium range missiles which the Soviets had in Cuba, which did not yet have nuclear weapons mated to them, they also had tactical nuclear weapons, which did have the nuclear uh, were ahead and they were ready to be used. So had he followed the advice, the recommendation of his military advisors, he would have sent troops into Cuba that they would have decimated on the beachhead with the tactical nuclear weapons and a general nuclear war would surely have followed. So a bad information, this lack of information could have led him to make a wrong decision which could have led to a nuclear war. Beyond that, there's a problem of an un the president might be an unstable decider. You've already mentioned President Trump, but that's not the only example. Uh, during the last few months of President Nixon's presidency, 
he was very heavily drinking and was not really in a position to make these decisions. He was so con the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense were so concerned about that that the Secretary of Defense, Jim Schlesinger, called the commander of the Strategic Air Command and told him not to obey any orders, not to take any orders from the president on launching without checking with him. But of course, that was particularly a completely illegal move on the part of the, pre of the, of the Secretary of Defense. And there's no reason to believe that the general would have followed that. And beyond that, the last few months that President Reagan was in office, he was in the early stages of Alzheimer's. So those things can happen. People are human. They are subject to these problems. And beyond that, of course, we've talked about the false alarm, and which President Carter was, was uh, uh, <clears throat> almost uh, was awoke in the middle of the night on that uh, false alarm I described to you. And today, beyond, beside the, ordinate, the, the past problems that could lead to false alarm, we have the additional aggravation of the possibility of a cyber attack. So all of these say, that the real danger is that we might blunder into a nuclear war. And yet that blundering, <clears throat> and that's what should be driving US policy, how to reduce the blunder, not how do we how do we respond to a bold out of the blue a surprise attack. Thank you, uh, Bill. Um, so, so what can we do about this? Let's get to solutions. Um, the next president can and must reorient policy away from a Russian surprise attack. Uh, to preventing accidental war. Um, and uh, in, in the book, we go through um, at least three uh, major solution areas that, that we think could really help this a lot. And Bill, if you could walk us through those. Well, the first thing is we should end sole authority. We do not need to rush into a nuclear war that will destroy mankind. There is pending in the Congress today, the Mark E. Lou bill to do just that has no chance of passing this year. We're focusing on next year. Hope with, with a new president and a new Congress, we have a chance of getting that passed. Uh, secondly, we should establish, we should abolish no first use, prohibit no first use. That we will use our weapons only for deterrence purposes. And again, there's a bill pending in the Congress today of the Warren Smith bill to promote that. But again, there's no likelihood that that bill will be passed this year or focused on next year. And finally, we should phase out our ICBMs. They are accidents waiting to happen. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm gonna wrap this up so we can get to uh, Philip and audience questions. But let me just say that I think it's pretty clear that nuclear weapons are the president's <clears throat> Um, and every four years, we have a chance to change U.S. nuclear policy. Uh, the current national crisis is creating a once-in-a-generation opportunity to rethink our fundamental approach to national security, and that U.S. nuclear policy is so out of step with reality that it is doing us more harm than good. And as currently configured, our arsenal magnifies the dangers we face from the most likely nuclear threat, which is blundering into nuclear war by mistake. Uh, so the next president can and must bring U.S. nuclear policy into the 21st century. So we're under no illusions. We know this will be really hard. Uh, we're up against 75 years of outdated thinking and a $50 billion industry. Uh, history tells us that changes like this don't happen unless they're led from the president um, with strong public support and public pressure to deliver on any promises the president makes. So we're looking to educate the next president uh, and the public and people like you. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you have any interest in buying the book, uh, please go to benbellabooks.com and you can use uh, this code um, button 30 to get a discount. And thank you uh, so very much. All right. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> All right, Tom, uh, Bill, thank you very much for the, that presentation. So I think what we're gonna do right now, um, one, just wanna remind people, uh, you know, the, uh, please have your questions. Um, you've heard what uh, Bill uh, Perry and Tom Kalina have uh, what, talk about the book. So that lays out a lot of different possibilities and I'll try to work them in. Let me, you know, the purpose of our conversation here, at least initially is to dig in a little bit deeper. I enjoyed the book, and as I read it, it occurred to me 
as I am trying to put it in perspective, that there are basically five ways that nuclear weapons can be used or somehow detonated. And the first, and you've addressed all of these. Um, one is a preemptive strike by an adversary. Um, second would be a response to a nuclear first strike or a response to an unacceptable non-nuclear attack. And the, the third, fourth, and fifth are miscalculation that you talked about, even a mechanical accident and a terrorist attack. So as I think about big picture, um, isn't it right, you know, Bill or Tom, maybe Bill, that what you're saying here is that the original purpose and the original and current purpose, as we've seen it so far, for possessing nuclear weapons, which are deterrents to prevent a nuclear attack and really war fighting capabilities to win a war, don't seem to be really valid anymore. Isn't, it? Isn't that right? I believe that is right. In fact, the nuclear weapons as we have them today are more of a danger to security than they are, an assist than they are providing for our security. And when we come to realize that, we have to change our policies altogether. Eventually, we're going to lead to a world with no nuclear weapons, but that's a long way away. In the meantime, we should be focusing on policies to reduce the dangers of the nuclear weapons we have, and certainly not aggravating those dangers by going into a new nuclear arms race, which we're about to do, which we're about to start right now. So, Bill, you you know you talked about a you know how it's unthinkable that it's a bolt out of the blue, a surprise attack from Russia is so unlikely. People talk about in the same context. Does that apply in your mind to places like North Korea and Iran, where some people would say we have to have these weapons? Um, you know, some of the people in our question queue are asking, don't we need to be able to launch U.S. Uh, U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons before a, a, a uh, uh, an attack comes, if that's the case? So. I, how, what's your reaction to that question or that rationale? Well, let's take North Korea, for example. Uh, I've had a good many meetings with North Korean leaders. One of them in particular I had along with Philip Yoon. We had a, a historic meeting in Pyongyang uh, two decades ago. So I have some knowledge of North Korean leaders and their military in particular. And I would also say about them what I said about the Russians, they are not stupid and they're not suicidal. They see their nuclear weapons as being there to provide for deterrence. Deterrence from what? And I asked that, of course, of the Russian military leaders and political leaders, and the answer was deterrence from you. They were very much concerned that we were going to take an action, military action to overthrow the regime, and they saw their nuclear weapons as a way of deterring us from doing that. So no, they're not going to be launching a surprise attack on us either. Okay. So Tom, let's go to the second piece of what was the original um, reason for nuclear weapons, which is what we called war fighting capabilities. In other words, if you're gonna fight something, you better win it. That's why we have so many of these, right? So in your mind, you know, let, let's ask this. Is a nuclear war, I mean, the military always thinks about winning if they're gonna fight something. Is a nuclear, is a war using nuclear we weapons winnable? Uh, I don't think in any traditional sense, no. I mean, I think there are no winners from a nuclear war, we're all losers. And so the key thing is to avoid it. And that's why in the book, we want to increase the president's decision time um, to think about starting nuclear war, to reduce the chances that it happens and to give the president as much time as possible. So for example, sole authority. Um, there's no reason why the president needs to make a decision about that nuclear war um, within minutes. And, and that kind of time pressure is dangerous. And, and just like our current policy of first use, you know, we think there is no scenario in which the United States wins by initiating a nuclear war. We don't want to start a nuclear war. Um, so our policy should be that we only have nuclear weapons to deter their use by others, uh, and that we would never use them first. And if we made that clear, which I think is de facto U.S. policy, has been so for decades, no president, no, no president in their right mind um, would start a nuclear war. So therefore, we should, we should cash that in and make it a benefit, make it clear to people, uh, and therefore help countries like Russia back away from their hair trigger. So what about, and you both you and Bill have written on this, but Tom, let me ask you this. So does it make sense to use nuclear weapons in the case of a non-nuclear attack? I mean, we're, there's some discussion there then, okay, let's see the rationale for why you would even have these, that if you make nuclear weapons smaller, not as you know, not as big as uh, um, what they call tactical battlefield ones. Does that make sense to you? 
Uh, it, it, it doesn't. I mean, if you, if you take the position that the U.S. loses if nuclear war starts, um, then even in a conventional war, uh, you wouldn't want to initiate the use of nuclear weapons unless someone else did that first. Um, and so in a no first use situation, you would say, look, we're not going to use them first, even if we're under conventional attack. And that was the policy of the Obama administration. And now that has been weakened um, by the Trump administration. Obama didn't go so far as to say no first use, uh, but they were clear um, that a conventional attack um, would not necessitate uh, a nuclear response. It's, it's the Trump administration is now blurring that line, uh, particularly on things, as you mentioned, low yield nuclear weapons, which blur the line between conventional and nuclear, uh, and could make leaders such as President Trump uh, think that uh, launching nuclear weapons uh, would be would be possible, which in my mind is is a tremendously dangerous possibility. Okay, so we just addressed really the first two preemptive strike response as which is really the original um, you know intent for having these weapons, and then you very persuasively talk about the last um, three as um, miscalculation. What I say, miscalculation, accident, and even a terrorist attack where nuclear weapons don't really make a difference in those things. And, and in essence, it becomes they're a liability and, and not an asset. So the real danger is mistake, anything not intentional. Um, so can you talk about, you know, so you talked about solo authority, first use, launching on warning. So Bill, tell me, why, why do we have solo authority to begin with? What, where did it come from in your mind? And, and uh, uh, so I think it's important that people understand that. Uh, sole authority has been a policy in the United States for decades for one reason, which is we had imagined that the Soviet Union is going to be, and later, and later Russia was going to conduct a surprise attack on us. And therefore, we had to respond very, very quickly. And if you believe that your response has to be in five, six, seven minutes, then you have no time for consultation. So the authority is vested in the president for, for making that decision. But that's just the wrong view, as we have tried to make point. That's the wrong threat, and therefore we have the wrong policy. And then someone just asked a question in, in the context of sole authority. Let me read this. Who is educating the next president on the dangers of one person being able to launch nuclear weapons? And who is going to talk about the president about giving other options about who should be involved in these decisions? And how would the US population react Maybe this is Tom. A question for you. Um, you know, react to change like this. So, Bill, do you know who's educating the president on this? The next president. Sorry, is that for me or for? Uh, why don't we do Bill? Bill, well, who do you who who normally educates the president or the incoming president on on this type of thing? Well, normally it would be the Secretary of Defense. Um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and then and the general of the Strategic Air Command would be the three candidates in that education. Uh, my own experience is that some presidents take that seriously and, and want to learn and, and make a real effort at learning. Most presidents do not. Uh, I doubt very much that, that the present president has <clears throat> been thoroughly and carefully educated on these issues. Okay. And then Tom, um, you know, what's, what would you think that, oh, I'm sorry. He's not alone on that. Okay. All right. Tom, um, how, how do you think, uh, you know, you're, you work on advocacy. Um, what's your sense of what would need to be done and what kind of reactions do you think you'd get on pushing this? What, what have we, what has happened so far when we push this? Well, so as, as Bill mentioned, there's legislation uh, in Congress um, authored by um, Senator Markey and Congressman Liu to try to bring Congress into this decision um, on, on presidential authority. So in other words, the president couldn't not launch nuclear weapons first uh, unless Congress concurred with that. Um, and, um, but, but ultimately, I think this is going to have to be a presidential decision. Uh, it's hard for Congress, certainly a, a, a split Congress like we have now, to take that, to get consensus and take that decision away from the president. Um, and, and, you know, we're certainly trying to educate the president ourselves with, th through the book um, and other means. Um, and it's hard for any one president to say, 
oh, okay, well, I'm not the president that should have this authority. Every, every president thinks that they can trust themselves with that authority. But the point is, is that over time, um, we've had presidents, the current president, other presidents who really aren't trustworthy with that authority. Um, and we're gonna have a con that kind of a president again. Um, so while we're focused on this issue, um, let's, take, let's have that authority, authority shared now between the White House and Congress so we don't have to worry about an unstable individual uh, ending the world as we know it. It's not worth it uh, and it's tremendously dangerous. So Bill, you know, in your mind, why do you think presidents have refused to give up the first use option? I think you, I think you have to go to psychologists to answer that question. Okay. No president that I've talked with was enthusiastic about giving up any power, unique power that he had as a president. And even, um, and this president, and, and, and this power, as dangerous as it is, I think is going to fall into that category. So it's going to take a lot of persuasion, I think, for the president to voluntarily give up this, this authority. He has to be convinced that the danger, and of course, one of the purposes of our book is to convince the president that this is a dangerous thing for himself and for the country. And so in practical, so, uh, you know, we're, we hear Donald Trump's um, name mentioned a lot here. Do you, you, do you feel that Donald Trump poses unique risks in, in the dangers related to this or not? No, I think this is a danger with every president, even, um, the, even the best qualified president, the most experienced president, and the most um, judgmental president, it's a, a danger. So I think that danger is amplified by a president like President Trump. And, it bring, and the good thing about that is that it highlights the issue in people's mind of what the danger is. But I think it's a danger with every president that we should not allow any president, no one person, whoever that person is, should have the authority by himself or by herself to end civilization. And that's what they have now. So Tom, there's a couple of questions here. Uh, you know, you, you, you alluded upon this, but let's, you know, Plowshares Fund is all about practical. It's about operations, um, getting something done. So, you know, in practical terms, how would one, you know, sole authority, first use, hair trigger alert, what are the things that, you, you know, people are, are, are thinking about doing? What have you been doing? And then maybe what do you think, um, you know, a Biden administration would handle these issues versus Donald Trump? Sure. Um, so, so thanks for that. Um, Plowshares uh, is a foundation that, that funds groups working in this space um, to, as you say, do practical things like educate their members uh, and educate members of Congress to, to take um, concrete actions like legislation. So I mentioned the Markey Lou bill um, to share uh, nuclear authority with Congress. So it's not just the president. Um, we also are working on a bill to declare U.S. policy um, where first use would be outlawed. Uh, and that's a bill that has been uh, co-sponsored by uh, Senator Warren and Chairman Smith uh, in the House. Um, and we're also working on legislation uh, to phase out land-based ballistic missiles. Uh, and this is an issue that is being championed right now by Congressman Ro Khanna in the House, because these are the weapons that would most likely be used first um, in a miscalculation, in a, in, a, in a false alarm accident situation. Uh, and they're weapons that we simply don't need for deterrence purposes. Um, deterrence can be carried out by the weapons that we have on submarines um, and on bomber airplanes. We don't need land-based ICBMs. And these are being rebuilt, the land-based ICBMs, at a cost of about $100 billion. Um, and at a time where we're dealing with COVID-19, uh, the economy situation that we have and unmet social needs, um, that's the kind of money that could really make a difference if it's repurposed. Okay, so Bill, um, there are a couple questions and we'll follow up on this on the land-based missiles. I mean, do we, do, you know, um, don't, the, the question is, there are, they're saying, don't we really need land-based missiles to maintain deterrence? I mean, um, they, they want to hear from you di as well what you think about that and what the argument is against for that, even though one of the things they were saying was couldn't, um, you know, advances in technology make submarines and even the bombers um, susceptible so that we therefore we need land-based uh, missiles. What's your reaction to that? 
many decades ago when I was the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, one of our major concerns was that the Soviet Union was finding a way to make the oceans transparent, that they'd be able to see the submarines and therefore they would not be in the sanctuary. And we spent quite a bit of time and quite a bit of money uh, working on trying to defeat those programs. It, uh, it's been a good many years since then. That was the late 1970s, so more than 40 years. Nobody has come up yet with a way of making the oceans transparent. Nobody's yet found a way of making submarines vulnerable to attack. But we can never say never. So therefore, while it's a, it's a danger that has been, I think, overemphasized, it's a danger that we have to pay attention to. And therefore, I would say that we ought to do two things if we eliminate JICMs. First of all, I have a robust R&D program in anti-submarine warfare so that we do everything we can to keep our submarines safe from attack. And I think we'd have, I, could have pretty, I could have high confidence that that could be successful. But secondly, we ought to work on having the bombers as a reasonable backup to the submarines. And that would involve having procedures for putting them on alert when, when we think there's a need, a need to do that. Uh, as it stands right now, it would take a long time to launch our bombers. So we, whereas during the Cold War, we had provisions um, whereby they could be in a the minutes. We ought to have a, on standby a set of procedures by which the bombers could be launched quickly as well. So those would be our two backups. Okay. And then, Tom, again, on the legislative side, since you're in D.C., what are the chances and what does it look like? I mean, how does it work? I mean, what are the chances that Congress would cancel a new ICBM program? Um, and, you know, is this, in your mind, a realistic um, proposition? Well, uh, great question. I think this is going to be, particularly on the ICBM, it'll be a multi-year effort because uh, a lot of it takes education. I mean, I think members um, think the way many Americans do, which is that, you know, nuclear weapons guarantee our security. We can't give them up even part of the arsenal. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do to convince people that ICBMs are not necessary for deterrence. And in fact, are more dangerous to us because of the false alarm danger. Um, so we've got our work cut out for us. It depends a lot on what happens uh, with the elections later this year, both in the White House and in Congress, and, and how, if we get a new president, say a Biden administration, um, how does he deal with all of the crises that we face, a lot of which have to do with budgets, right? How are we going to pay down uh, the deficit? Uh, how are we going to reinvest in the economy? Um, and how are we going to take care of the coronavirus issues and, and racial injustice? Um, all of this uh, takes money. Uh, where is it going to come from? One place it could come from is reducing uh, defense spending. Uh, and, a, and a ripe target in there is reducing the $2 trillion program to rebuild the U.S. nuclear arsenal. And the primary target there is the ICBM. So a new president could decide to um, take a re-look at how we're doing security and nuclear security in particular and could save a lot of money uh, if they do it in a new way. So there are a lot of questions about Russia, um, which is obviously the U.S.-Russia relationship um, is, <laughs> is, is as bad as it's ever been. U.S. and Russia have 90% of the existing uh, weapons that, uh, um, in the world at this point. Um, so, uh, you know, Bill, how, how, what is, do you think if, if, if Russia and China, so China is another mention, adopted, what would their reaction be if the U.S. adopted no first use? And do you think this is a good idea? I don't think that would have a real impact on the policies of either Russia or China. Uh, a more, something that might be more concerning is we adopted a policy of, of not matching them missile for missile in the, in the new, new nuclear arms race, which is on the way today. When we decided we would not participate in this arms race, in particular, not build more ICBMs and not, and not and work, work hard to try to get back in the nuclear treaties. I think in a, it's really important to try to get back into the uh, treaties on nuclear weapons. And I would hope that the new president would, would, would do that. But the important thing, I think, for Russia is that 
we do not have to match them missile for missile. We have to be assured that we have deterrence and we can do that in many ways. But deterrence is not the same thing as parity. Parity, which means we have to have every missile that they have and maybe a little bit more, which has really been a policy during the Cold War and, 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 and lately. So no, we do not have to match them missile for missile. Uh, and if we think we do, we're not able to make a policy based on U.S. needs, not based on Russian needs. So, Bill, let me follow up on that, because I remember hearing you speak a while ago and someone asked you a question, what keeps you up at night? And, and as you think about it, you, one of the many things, but you would emphasize the notion that um, the, you know, your grandchildren would have to, have to endure another arms race. Um, you know, in the world and something that you had experienced when in your younger years. How, you know, and again, we've, you've, you're talking about this, you talked about arms control. How did we get here to this new arms race? I mean, in your mind, um, and you talk about earlier how we don't get into it, but how, why are we in this now? How did this happen in your mind? I think two reasons. First of all, we have responded to what we think the Russians are doing. Um, the Russians not only are building a whole new set of strategic weapons, nuclear weapons, but they're, but they're, be, they're bragging about it, they're boasting about it. And so we are in effect responding to that. But secondly, we're just continuing to live in the Cold War mentality. That's what we did in the Cold War, that's what, what we ought to be doing now. Okay, so uh, Tom, question about uh, US bases in New Turkey and Europe, you know, um, how are these nations involved in any kind of decision-making related to those weapons? Um, are there U.S. weapons based in any Asian nations, and if not, why? <laughs> uh, so U.S. nuclear weapons um, in, in low numbers are based in Europe, uh, and uh, Turkey is one of those bases. I, I think it's a real um, problem that they are. Um, if you look at recent uh, political activity in Turkey, um, potential coups and that kind of thing, you really have to question the security um, of the bases there and, and the U.S. nuclear weapons that are there. Uh, Turkey can't use those nuclear weapons um, without U.S. approval. Uh, but, you know, there are security concerns uh, that we have to take seriously. And it's really hard to, I can't even uh, begin to describe um, the concerted occurrence that there are, and the fact that there's real no strategic rationale um, to have those weapons there. I mean, what would we do with them? They would be overrun if there really was any kind of uh, attack um, from Russia. Uh, so we should be getting all nuclear weapons out of Europe, uh, bring them back to the United States where they're uh, much safer and more secure, uh, and, um, and, and then we can really talk about whether we need so-called tactical nuclear weapons at all. Mm -hmm. uh, more generally, Phil, I think there's yeah. no valid security reasons <clears throat> for maintaining our nuclear weapons outside of the continental United States or in our submarines. Okay, so he, there's a question, a couple of questions, and one that I had that have to do with the idea of sort of loose nukes. Um, and so maybe Tom, you know, and the context was essentially if, if Putin is suddenly removed from power, but you could substitute that name, Tom, you talked a little bit about that with respect to Turkey, North Korea is another country, even Pakistan. What can the U.S. do or should do to secure the fissile material, the nuclear weapons? I mean, is that something that you, that you worry about? Sure. I mean, this was the great concern um, when the Soviet Union collapsed at the end of the Cold War, and Bill knows a ton about this. Uh, the real concern was what happens to all the warheads and the nuclear material. Uh, and so we, the United States, uh, and Bill in particular, spent, spent years of time trying to make sure that that material did not go missing, did not get sold to the highest uh, bidder. And it's, it's, it's one of the sad stories of the, of the collapse of sort of, we had this renaissance of U.S.-Russian relations at the end of the Cold War um, that has now been, been wasted and we no longer have the cooperation that we used to have on controlling these materials. Because, of course, we can't do it without Russian cooperation. But, Bill, why don't you talk to this? Yeah, Bill, please. You're very much involved in that. And I think people should know. Probably a lot of people are not aware of that cooperation that occurred um, and the amount of time and effort the administration took 
to you know, find the money to make that happen. So maybe you can describe a little bit about what that is because it's really a very good news story and there's no reason why it can't be repeated in, in various, um, in other forms. When the Soviet Union collapsed, there were nuclear weapons in three other countries besides Russia and the three of the new countries, uh, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus, a total of 4,000 nuclear weapons. I mean, they had huge arsenal of nuclear weapons in those three countries. They had no policy reasons for needing them, and they had no technical reasons for taking good care of them. So we thought this was a huge danger. <clears throat> the program was, the problem was first recognized by Senator Nunn and Senator Lugar, and they sponsored legislation known as the Nunn-Lugar program, where the United States put up the resources and the technical help to help dismantle all 4,000 of those nuclear weapons. And when I became the Secretary of Defense, that was one of my main responsibilities. In fact, the one I considered my most important responsibility was executing that non lugar program. And we did that in three years' time. We dismantled 4,000 nuclear weapons in those three countries. Um, the fissile material from those weapons was sent back to the United States and used in our running our nuclear reactors, providing electricity in our homes. But that, was, that program took the full cooperation of Russia to do that, as well as the cooperation of those three new nations. It was a good news story, not from a <clears throat> point of view of our security, but from the point of view of the, the demonstrated that you could have that kind of cooperation between the United States and Russia. Those are the golden days of US-Russia relations, where we're working together, not only for a common purpose, but almost as allies. Okay. Question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, actually, a question from, from Joshua that goes back to the assumption of deterrence. And I think maybe, Tom, you can follow up. It says, it seems the common assumption for deterrence is for defensive uses. And are, you know, what can be done about states that may want to use deterrence to protect themselves um, and, be, and then you know, pursue preemptive action. I mean, it seems this is a, maybe a mistake scenario. What do you, what do you think about that? Um, where people are, you know, they're using it to protect themselves that may you know, end up doing offensive actions. Well, the, the, the possibility of preemptive use is, is something that comes up and has in fact um, kind of prevented some presidents from, from taking a no first use pledge. The scenario is that, that some other country is about to launch an attack at you um, so you would preempt, so you would go first to try to, to take out or blunt their attack. Um, the problem with this is that knowing that or thinking that another country is about to attack you is based on intelligence. Um, and, and we simply can't be 100% confident that that intelligence is correct. So in, in my mind, uh, no rational president um, would ever launch a nuclear attack uh, based on the intelligence that another country is about to do so. Um, because you could have just then started a nuclear war by mistake. Um, so that's, again, another reason why I think uh, the United States can and should uh, announce a no first use policy, uh, because there are no scenarios, no realistic scenarios, where the United States would use nuclear weapons first. And this kind of mythology around preemption is just one of those reasons that sort of spooks presidents um, uh, and ultimately, um, they, they don't take the plunge and, and go for no first use. So, so here, the, there's a clarification. So I think what he's, this, uh, Joshua was talking about is, wouldn't um, having nuclear weapons encourage an in a country to use conventional action knowing that no one would go after them? Does it encourage people to be more adventurous um, and do things that are much more... Uh, uh, provocative because they have nuclear weapons. I want to answer that. Yeah. Uh, Phil, is that that's why we have such a strong conventional forces. Yeah. We have conventional forces are strong enough that anybody that tries to use conventional forces against us or an ally would would be uh, would have very soon found out he was making a huge mistake. We do not need nuclear weapons to deter conventional attacks. We have a very. That's why we have such a strong conventional. That's why we spend so much putting together our military and training our military to be prepared to take these actions. Okay, so there's another question, which I think really is actually an interesting one, but it goes to the larger question of 
uh, missile defense, um, destabilizing. Uh, the Trump administration has launched with some fanfare the U.S. Space Force, which sounds very much like President Reagan's Star Wars defense initiative. Is Space Force realistic? What is its purpose? Is it destabilizing in some ways? Uh, so, Tom, Bill, if you want to chime in, please feel free. <laughs> Uh, well, luckily, at this point, the Space Force doesn't seem to have much in common with the Strategic Defense Initiative from the Reagan years. Uh, that really was a space-based missile defense system. Um, the Trump administration is still investing in and pushing missile defense, but, but they're ground-based defenses um, at this point. Um, and so from, from the missile defense perspective, you know, I don't think the Space Force is a real concern, but missile defense still is a real concern because we have to remember that this is a system that has not been proven to work. Uh, the tests that are being done are not realistically done. Uh, and yet this system is preventing Russia from going lower uh, in nuclear weapons that are threatening us. So we want them to go lower in their forces, but they're resisting doing that because of our missile defenses. And China is building up its arsenal in part because of the missile defenses that they see we're deploying. Uh, so it's still a real problem. If we ever want to get down to much lower levels of nuclear weapons, we need to think about limiting our own missile defenses. I uh, feel that's not a main point in our book, but we do devote a whole chapter to missile defense. Yeah. And the basic point of that chapter is that the missile defense systems we have deployed simply do not work to do what we think they're going to do. And even if we build twice as many of them or three times as many of them, they're not going to work. And so besides the money we waste on doing that, we also create reactions which are harmful to our policy. As we deploy these missile defenses, the other countries, China, Russia, for example, think maybe they will, maybe they will work and therefore they build, they, they're motivated to increase their offensive forces to offset that. And we see that particularly happen in China today. So we have um, a few more minutes. I want to get in maybe one more question, um, uh, two more questions. Uh, Tom, so let's, yeah, this is a big question, but, um, you know, Biden administration comes in. I mean, this is, I think, very interesting for people to think about. You know, Obama, President Obama came in with high hopes. Um, in fact, you know, he expressly talked about the world without nuclear weapons and, you know, not a lot, things happen. And I don't get me wrong, because I was involved in this with you on these things, but not what, we're, what we thought we were going to be. So is there something that you think um, at Biden administration, if people are more inclined to go in the direction that you all are, are recommending, how, what are some of the, you know, very quickly, what are the mistakes that can be avoided? Or what can people do, in a sense, to make sure it doesn't, uh, that, that um, you know, it, were, they're able to actually do things more so than what actually happened under the Obama administration. Right. Um, great question. Uh, and hopefully if a President Biden uh, takes office, um, he will have learned from some of the successes and, and mistakes of his time in the Obama administration. Um, but first, you know, one of the things the Obama administration did get right is, is set out the policy early. Um, and Obama gave a speech in Prague right away talking about uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons and a nuclear-free future and ha how to get there. Um, and, and so I would, I would urge a Biden administration to also get out early with, with new aggressive, bold policies. Um, uh, some of the problems to avoid is that it really matters um, who you name to some key jobs. As we say, people are policy. Um, and not all of uh, some, a lot of great people in the Obama administration um, a lot of friends of mine who did a great job, but not everyone was on board with Obama's agenda. And you really need the right people pushing the policies because this is the next piece, the president gets distracted naturally. The president has many, many things to do. Um, and unless this issue is prioritized among the top, you know, three or four things that a president does, um, they won't keep their eye on the ball and it'll be left to the people um, in the agencies to implement. So, so the two things I would urge uh, a Biden administration to do is come out early with the policies, choose the right people, and then prioritize these issues throughout. Okay, so final question here. Um, and uh, so, you know, 
COVID night, the COVID nineteen pandemic, the outrage over you know uh, George, you know uh, George Floyd's death. I mean, we, we see that humans are human beings are quick to react, you know, to something in the face of the immediate. However, we're very bad at dealing with really big problems that take time to develop, and until it's really too late. Um, and in the case of nuclear weapons, as you talk about, um, this would be really tragic. So this is the last question. Uh, you know, in about a minute or so, if people, you know, we we spent you know a great deal of time, you know, 50 minutes with you, amazing amount of information. What you what would in your mind are the two key takeaways that you want people to take from um, their time with you here today, Bill? First of all, that our nuclear policy is focused on the wrong threat. We are not subject, realistically, to a surprise attack we are in great danger of blundering into a nuclear war. And therefore our policies ought to be oriented around lowering that danger. That's really, I think, the most significant takeaway from, 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 our, from our book. Okay, thank you. Tom? For me, the key issue um, that I think we can, we can at least grasp today uh, is the president has sole authority to launch, you know, up to a thousand nuclear weapons um, within minutes. Um, and if you consider the current president, but also all presidents, um, this is just a tremendously dangerous situation. Yet we as Americans have to realize that we are letting this happen. Um, and if we want to talk to our members of Congress and change this, we can. And, and so I think that's the most single most important thing we can do to, to reduce the risks we currently face from nuclear weapons uh, is taking away sole authority and retiring uh, the nuclear football. Okay. All right, so we're about, um, I wanna make sure that we get out on time at one o'clock. Um, you know, thank you so much to, to Bill Perry and to Tom Kalina, authors of the, the book, where is it right here? Yes, The Button, okay? It's, it's, it's a really great read. It's very accessible and it gives you a lot of information. Hope that you will buy it and talk with your friends about it. Um, thank you, Bill and Tom. Um, I wanna, Please note that our upcoming conversation, uh, we have one on, was it Wednesday, June 17th at noon. It's gonna be preparedness, climate, wildfires, and health. Um, many thanks to the Pacific Council for International Policy for partnering with us on this program. And finally, if you like what you heard, please consider investing in us, World Affairs, with a gift uh, or donation at worldaffairs.org, that's one word. But also remember that um, our two guests here um, are members of diff are parts of different organizations as well. Tom Kalina is at um, Plowshares Fund. Um, you know, nuclear weapons is very complicated. They know where the money is supposed to go. And then we have the William Perry Project, right, Bill? So thank you again to Bill Perry and Tom Kalina. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much for having us here. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was great. Uh, it was so much fun. And thank you to all of you. Um, wherever you are, please be very safe, uh, stay healthy, and um, let's see what we can do to make this world a, a better place and, and do our part. So thank you all, and um, hopefully we'll see you again.